Good morning, everybody, again. Believe it or not, one of the things I like to do is to exercise, despite how I may look. I do enjoy exercising. Uh, the idea of going to the gym and just kind of forgetting about whatever's going on throughout the day and listening to a song or a podcast and then just uh, beginning on the treadmill is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I don't run, as I mentioned last week, uh, despite Brian's best efforts to try to influence me. I don't run. I'm like a giraffe that has long legs and kind of hobbles around. That's me. But I will set the incline as high as it can go and try to walk as fast as I can uphill. I'm not sure that's any smarter <laughs> than not running, but that's what I like to do. It gets your, your cardio up and your thing, you're moving uphill. But every time I get on the treadmill and set that incline up, it reminds me of a moment in my life and it always brings me back there. Uh, for my bachelor party, what I decided was a great idea was for me and the preacher's brother to go hiking the Appalachian Trail. And we lived right down the road from it, you know, maybe two hours away, and we just parked my little Corolla on the side of a road in the middle of nowhere in the woods, left a little note that said, we'll be back in a couple of days, and then just walked up this hill and went winding down this trail in Virginia, and um, we were great planners when it came to what it took for us to go hiking for about a week. Now, we had little bags of tuna fish. We had like four or five of those for a week. It was plenty. Uh, water, we stopped by a gas station along the way and got a decent-sized bottle of Dasani <laughs> for a week. And we're like, we're good. We're going to be just fine. And so we got out of the car and got our packs on that were heavy, full of things we didn't needed. And then we hiked along this trail, and we came to a part of the actual trail in Virginia where it looked nearly vertical. And so we're like, the trail goes up there. Well, let's get started before dark comes, and we'll set up our tent, and we'll be prepared for the evening, and then we'll just see where the trail takes us. Keep going, it goes all the way to Maine, but we weren't going that far for a week, right? So we hiked up this hill, and, and Jake, the guy I went with, was in much better shape than I was. He had been hitting the gym since he was a wrestler in high school, and he was really, really old for me. He was 26 years old. I was barely 17 or 18, so he was a full adult. I wasn't there yet. So he was in great shape, and he was got his backpack on and was holding up the 30 pounds of stuff we didn't need in his backpack. And, and we were walking up this hill, and we started going and started climbing, and we were going up this incline. And literally about 10 seconds in of going up this ramp of this trail, I was done. I was gassed. <laughs> My legs were on fire. My lungs apparently had like evaporated in some kind of mist that was hot. It was terrible. It was the worst thing I'd ever felt in my physical body in my entire life. So Jake is like, yeah, that's pretty rough, right? I'm like, I can't go anymore. And he was like, yeah, we need to go. So I grab my water, my big bottle of Dasani, and take a swig and then close it back up and throw it in the pack, and we keep going. And about halfway up this mountain, I look at Jake and I say, Jake, I can't do this, man. He was like, yeah, you can. I was like, no, I can't, man. I really can't go up this hill. He's like, you're going to have to. I'm like, I'm going. I'm like, okay. So we get up there, and my legs are still, I can't feel them anymore. They're so on fire. And I'm hobbling up there. I'm holding this backpack. It has nothing important in there. So 30 pounds of nothing. And I'm just walking up this hill, and we finally get to the top. And I'm like, dude, we did it. He was like, yeah, we did it. And then we realize we're both out of water. It's been like three hours, y'all. <laughs> so we're like, all right, I've got a topographical map of the Appalachian Trail. Here's our quadrant. Here's our section. Here's where we're supposed to go. I know that we have little highlighted springs, freshwater springs from the mountains that are all around us. But one of the things we didn't think about was the fact that we had just hiked up a mountain, and apparently water doesn't flow uphill. <laughs> so we're at the top. And here we are, this all has a point, I'm, I promise you. So we're at the top, and I'm like, well, let's pitch our tent. We're done three hours, we're tired. Let's take a nap. And so we get the tent going, we realize we have no water, 
And they were like, well, there's a spring like three miles that way. Perfect. Totally walkable. So here's Jake's plan. And I loved it. So he was an adult. He knew what he was doing. He goes, let me go scout ahead. I go, okay, sounds good. I'll go find the spring and then come back to tell you where it is. I'm like, perfect. That sounds like a good idea. So he goes three miles one way, finds the spring. It's not really a spring. It's a muddy, brackish-looking hole where, you know, didn't look tasty, I'll tell you that. And so he goes, I found it. Okay, we're going to have to use our purifying tablets, but we can drink this water. Like, perfect. He didn't bring any bottles with him to fill while he was there. He was just going scouting to tell me where it was. So I'm like, all right, so your plan was to go find it, not fill up the water bottles, but then come back to tell me where it was, and now I have to go out there and get the water bottles filled, right? He's like, yeah, perfect. So he's back, and I'm tense up. I grab the two water bottles we have, the Dasani water bottles, and I go three miles one way, and I see a mud hole. So I put a little cloth over it and dip it in the water and put the iodine tablets in there and shake it all up, and it looks about how, how, how good you think a mud hole would look. And so I chug one while I'm there, and now my belly's full of water, fill it up one more time. So here I am carrying two Dasani bottles up the mountain that we just hiked up again, back up the mountain, got to him, gave him his water, we killed it in an hour, and that was our experience. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't make it a week. We made it like two days, and we got bored and decided to come back home. So that was my bachelor party. Wasn't it riveting? <laughs> now, I say all that to say, if you've ever walked uphill like I do every week, and I get on that treadmill, I think about how dumb I was as an 18-year-old going on this, this bachelor party. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. The beginning of the so-called Sermon on the Mount. Now, the mountain was not like the mountain I climbed. I can almost guarantee it. But in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountainside. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. That's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Probably the greatest sermon ever preached. You have God in the flesh, teaching his people, his followers, what it means to be like God in this earth. Echoing that same sentiment in is Exodus chapter 19 and verse 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. God descends to the top of the mountain and calls for Moses to come and meet him. Moses climbs the mountain with Joshua, and they meet God on the mountain. Every time that someone wants to get closer to the heavens or God himself, there is a mountain involved. Every time. We think about Mount Sinai for Moses. When he was originally called, that was, believe it or not, a mountain. Mount Sinai kind of gave it away, right? In Jerusalem, where the temple would be erected and where they would commune with God himself, we have Mount Zion. Right, Bev? Right. And then we have the Mount of Transfiguration, where you have Jesus revealing his true nature to Peter, James, and John. He's there with Moses on the mountain, as he always was, and Elijah. Every time someone wants to get close to God, they have to climb that mountain. And so I ask the question to you, how in shape did Moses have to be to keep climbing those mountains to get close to the presence of God? I'll tell you what, I go to the gym at least once a week. Ideally, I'm shooting for three or four times a week. I always begin it on the treadmill to warm up, get my blood, my blood pumping. I get the incline going. And every day I go to the gym, I come home, and I look at myself in the mirror, and nothing's changed, folks. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, but you can't just go to the gym once and have your whole body transformed. What am I missing? Sure, I eat brownies and donuts and cupcakes. 
love pasta. Yeah, I, sure. If you go to the gym once, you should be ripped after that, right? <laughs> Apparently not. Moses also wasn't built to climb those mountains to get closer to God from day one. What I want to do this morning is quite simple. I love the life of Moses because it's so intricate, so detailed. We have a lot about what he was thinking, what he was doing, what he was feeling. And the same kind of thing with David. We have a lot about the life of David and the life of Moses. And I also love the life of Moses because God knew we're going to be preaching sermons about his life. He lived to be 120 years old. And that thankfully breaks down into three equal segments. So God knew we're preaching about the guy that has three parts to his life. Let's begin our conversation this morning talking about his childhood. This is from age zero to age 40. It's just so clean how it breaks down. So then you have 40 to 80 and 80 to 100. How about that? Let's begin talking about his childhood. What prepared him to be in such good shape spiritually to climb those mountains and to reach God? Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with butamen and pitch, and she put the child in and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Now, I don't know why in my head I always just read super hard into this text. I don't know if it was a movie I saw or a cartoon, but I just imagine the mother of Moses putting him in this ark, this, this basket, and then just pushing him down the river. <laughs> That's how I always imagined it. But she just placed him among the reeds. Verse 4, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be, would be, what would be done to him. Verse 5, now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river. And she saw the basket among the reeds, and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. Well, as they do, <laughs> right? She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she no named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, this story is pretty famous. Hopefully you've heard it before. If you haven't, uh, then I think that the intelligence and the wisdom seen from Moses' mother here to know that her child's life was in danger and to place him exactly where he was to get Pharaoh's daughter's attention. That she would have pity and love for him, and that she would get paid to nurse her own child was a bit extra, right? I mean, that was wisdom, that was compassion, uh, that was clever at the very least. And we don't have a whole lot of information biblically about the, uh, the connection that Moses had to growing up in Pharaoh's household, but he knew that he was a Hebrew among the Egyptian people. And we see that really recorded for us uh, later in his life when he grows up. But one thing this reminds me of, of having such a godly mother who was wise and clever enough to allow her son to escape uh, this, this terrible time in history, was 2 Timothy chapter 1. The idea of having a godly mother, and even grandmother, to help show you the way, gently lead you to the path of the Lord is a very important biblical concept. Second Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, Paul wrote this, As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. 
Paul's just writing to his young preacher friend saying, last time we were together, I saw you cry. I know you miss me. I miss you. It reminds me so much of the faith that was given to you in, in legacy form by your grandmother and your mother. So what prepared Moses to be in the best physical and spiritual shape to climb those mountains to reach God? Well, his childhood definitely helped. If we keep reading in our text here of Exodus chapter 2, we'll see that he thought of himself as some kind of champion. Some kind of champion. In verse 11 of our text, Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burden. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. So he knew where he was from and who he was. He looked this way and that. And I love that the Bible is so clear in the words that it uses. But I also kind of sense a little bit of extra kind of, kind of spice there, if you will. The idea of him looking this way, looking that way. My people are getting beaten. And when he saw no one, he struck down the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Now you might wonder, as I have, why he did this. He just murdered somebody. He just took the life of an Egyptian that was beating one of his kinsmen. And the only thing I can come to is he thought that he was going to be the redeemer of his people. He was born at a special time and a special place in Pharaoh's household. He had a wise and clever mother to help guide him into the ways of Yahweh. And then here we have him as a grown man, 40 years old, looking at his people being abused and says, you know what, I can do something about this. He took the opportunity and he killed the Egyptian. Verse 13 of our text. When he went out the next day, you can imagine his excitement of getting away with the murder, of saying, this is how it's going to happen. My people have been abused now for an entire generation. They tried to kill all of us when we were young because they're threatened by our numbers and our strength. And now is the chance where I can be the person that I need to be to save the people from the Egyptian taskmasters. And here, the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. They were fighting amongst each other. He said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And then the guy who was being told off by Moses said this in response, verse 14. He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Who do you think you are? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? He wasn't being perceived as a redeemer as a savior, as a leader, he's being perceived as someone who wants to take the reins of the nation and take that by force. Then, verse 14, part B, Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. I thought I got away with killing that Egyptian. They know who did it. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, And he sat down by a well. What I wouldn't give to have climbed that mountain and saw a well waiting for me. (laughs) Here is Moses. He's grown up, no doubt influenced by his godly mother. He knows who he is, where he's from. And he thought he knew that he was the champion of the the, uh, Israelite people. He thought he was the one that was chosen by God to be in that position at that point in time to save the people by force. When that wasn't the case, his dreams no doubt were dashed about who he was, and he fled for his life. He went to Midian, pretty far away away, by the way. If you have a map in your Bible, you'll be able to know exactly how far he went. He sat down by a well. Now, the priest of Midian, verse 16, had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Talking about sheep here. Verse 17, the shepherds came and drove them away, and here's our boy. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. Here's Moses again, seeing himself as some kind of champion. He's there, fleeing his life from Pharaoh, going to Midian, finding a well, 
seeing these seven daughters taking care of their father's flock, and they're being driven away by the other shepherds, and he stands up and saves the day. Verse 18, when they came home to their father, Reuel said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian, not quite right, but he's from Egypt, delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a, so a sojourner or a pilgrim in a foreign land. So, so far, the life of Moses has prepared him for many things. First 40 years, he thought he was being prepared to be the champion of the Hebrew people. This next 40 years, from 40 to 80, he has now settled down. He's got a family. He has a life. He's got a new job, being a shepherd of Jethro, his father-in-law's flock. And he's content to have that life. And then out of nowhere, there's this third section. We have him in his childhood, him as a champion, quote-unquote, and then he is called. Going to our text of Exodus chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. Now it wasn't known by the mountain of God, that name here in Exodus chapter 3, but reflecting back on the events, that was the mountain of God. Beginning in verse 2. And the angel of the Lord, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And behold, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Now, I don't know how country all are here in Macon, or where you grew up, but I grew up in a place called Gloucester County, Virginia, that no one's ever heard of. If you know Newport News, or you know Williamsburg, if you know Yorktown, if you know Norfolk or Virginia Beach, Keep going north up the coast. Eventually, you get to a place where there's no more interstates, there's no more main roads. You have Gloucester County, Virginia. The best thing to do in Gloucester County, Virginia was get into your Z71 Silverado and go to the Walmart parking lot and just hang out. That was about it, folks. Right? So... One of the great pastimes we had was instead of taking trash or brush down to the dump, as you would, you take it into the backyard. And you put some kind of flammable liquid on there, and you see how big of a fireball you can create until your neighbors call the cops on you, right? That's a good activity. Uh, diesel works pretty well. Kerosene works pretty well. But my favorite one was gasoline. Don't try that at home. Apparently, gasoline explodes if you have enough of it and you're standing right on it. I had a next-door neighbor. His name will be uh, not said out loud. But Robert would go out in the backyard, and he had this stump. And he had this stump of a tree in his backyard, and he must have hated that stump. He shot his gun at it all the time. He was just sick and tired of it. So one day what he did was he completely doused it in gasoline. And then he let for it to dry, and more gasoline. It would dry, more gasoline. And then he wanted to stand over it with a lighter. So we're in the house, and then all of a sudden we hear an explosion. We hear... Boom! And even the windows are shaking and rattling. We're like, what just happened? And it was Robert in the backyard. All his eyebrows were gone, right? Just, just cinched. So I know about a big old fire. So here is Moses taking care of the sheep, walking around the mountain of God, and he sees a bush on fire. He's like, that's pretty cool. I mean, you know, fire's pretty cool, right? And it's not going away, though. The bush isn't being burnt up. The fire isn't subsiding. So he, and here's his thoughts. I, I love this. This is just, it reminds me of, of my brain. Verse 3, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Like he's like, hey man, I think it's on fire over there. It's not going away. I'm going to just stop here and watch that fire for a second. All right? That's him. When the Lord saw 
that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. The only response, apparently, from biblical people when God calls you by name. He said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the, because the place on which you are standing is set apart or holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, that's the beginning of Moses. We have phase one, the childhood. You have phase two, he thought he was a champion. I mean, he tried and he failed, right? By his own strength, he could not save the people of Israel. And then he was called to be the savior of the people of Israel through God's might and God's power. This first confrontation, this first introduction on the mountain of God, Mount Oreb, of who God is and who Moses was to be, we see him come up with every excuse in the book, every excuse of why he's not the right one. Little did he know God had planned for him to be on a fitness regimen. <laughs> Phase one was, hey, you had a godly mother who was wise, who was clever, who was paid to take care of you as a baby. That's your introduction. Then you are in Pharaoh's household, and you had the zeal. You had the motivation to be the person that saved your own people. And now you've been taking care of really dumb animals in large numbers for the last 40 years. You're ready for people now. It's funny how every great leader was always a shepherd. And then we are called the sheep. The good shepherd takes care of us, right? So we've got Moses working out, planning, preparing to be the person God needs him to be in that moment. Now, if you want to see some growth, remember in our text, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 24. It's going to be our last passage for the morning. Pretty sure. Exodus 24 is significantly different than Exodus 3, but quite similar in a couple of regards. Exodus 24, beginning in verse 9. This is a lot of growth has happened in the life of Moses, the confidence of Moses. Then Moses and Aaron, verse 9, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel. They were under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Same kind of idea of Exodus 3. God appeared before Moses. He did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. And then the Lord said to Moses, verse 12, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. Verse 14, he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. Behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. Sound familiar? On the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel, Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 
When he's first called in Exodus chapter 3, as soon as he sees that fire and he knows God is near, he turns his face. He can't bear to look at God's image. He doesn't even want to hear what the mission is. He's already got excuses ready to go of why he's not the man. He's not the guy for the job. Here in Exodus 24, you've got all the people now going to the mountain of God. You have the leaders around Moses with Joshua. God calls Moses to enter into his presence, and Moses goes. No hesitation, no doubt. He's been up that mountain before. Now, here's the point. Moses was prepared by God to be the kind of person he needed to be to save the people, to redeem them from Egypt. He didn't know he was in training. He didn't know he was under phase one, phase two, or phase three to be prepared physically and spiritually to be the leader God needed him to be. And folks, we're all in training now too. It may not look like it, I'll tell you. (laughs) It may not feel like it, but our experiences, our knowledge, the wisdom given unto us by those that came before us we are all being prepared to be in the best spiritual shape of our lives, to have no fear but boldness to to approach the throne of grace of God, to be the kind of people He needs us to be to tell the world about what His Son did for us. Our mission is not just simply to march into Pharaoh perform some miracles, some signs, some wonders, and to redeem the physical nation of Israel, our mission is to tell the world about who Jesus is. And we are in training right now for it. If Moses could be the kind of person God needed him to be in that moment, at that time, having his childhood, himself thinking he's some kind of champion, and then having the calling from being a shepherd of sheep to a shepherd of God's flock, we have gone through similar things in this life that have prepared us, if we're willing to listen to what God needs us to do, to be exactly His servants in this world. That's the message for me, the message for you. Please learn from my dumb mistakes, and don't climb that mountain without being prepared. We have a mountain ahead of us to share the gospel with the world. But God is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. If anyone has a need to respond to the invitation of our Lord this morning, this moment is yours. Look within and see what God has given you in your life when it comes to your knowledge and experience to prepare you to be the kind of person He needs you to be in this world. If you've not yet begun your journey with God and you want to be baptized into Christ to start your life new and to begin marching up that mountain to meet God, now is the opportunity to think about that. If you're someone who began that march and you are tired and your legs are on fire and you don't have enough fuel in your body to carry you up to be in God's presence we're all marching along with you. Let us help you. We're your family in Christ. You can lean on us anytime. If you have a need to obey the gospel or to get encouraged this morning, please respond by coming forward now as we stand and we sing.